Chemistry is often thought to date back to 1661 when Robert Boyle of Oxford published The Skeptical Chemist. But long before this, since the time of Aristotle and even before, scientists were questioning what makes up matter. Democrates, back in 460 BC, came up with the term atoms and he said that these were indivisible particles. Democrates basically said that if you continually cut something into pieces, you'll eventually get down to an indivisible particle called an atom, which can be cut no more, or broken down to no smaller pieces. Aristotle, a great thinker he was, he believed that one material could be changed into another by changing the proportions of the four elements, and those four elements were air, water, earth and fire. This led alchemists for hundreds of years trying to turn base metals into gold, also known as the Philosopher's Stone, or looking for panacea, which was a cure for all illnesses. And it wasn't until Robert Boyle um, that a distinction between alchemy and chemistry was a, or became distinct, I guess. Okay, so he's thought of being the father of modern chemistry. He used experiments with scientific method to test ideas, and this was the basic difference between alchemists who were just doing things randomly to actual modern chemistry. Robert Boyle defined an element as the, sum as the something that cannot be broken down into simpler substances. He conducted experiments which proved that earth, air, fire and water could not be extracted from gold. A couple of other scientists that are really important. Um, there's been so many that don't get much credit at all, but I just want to mention a couple here. Henry Cavendish, he discovered hydrogen. He also measured the earth's density. Now, this is a pretty big achievement in 1766, considering only 200 years before that they thought that the world was flat. He used experimental method. I mean, it's not like he could use a satellite or anything. And he also did some early electricity experiments. There was Joseph Priestley, who was credited with isolating oxygen, although it's believed that another scientist may have done so earlier and just didn't publish it. He also invented carbonated drinks, but this is how he figured out what oxygen was. This is a great picture here. Basically, he would put a mouse into a closed system and the mouse would die because it would run out of oxygen. However, here he put a mouse into a closed system with a plant um, and as you can see here, he thought that plants can improve what he called injured air. He thought that the mouse was injuring the air. But further experiments led him on to um, realising that that was oxygen. So these were the first photosynthetic experiments. Lavoisier, a Frenchman, actually got decapitated in the revolution, but before that he came up with the process of combustion. He realised that water was made up of, um, or could be made up by burning hydrogen in oxygen, and also came up with the law of conservation of mass. So that law is whatever goes into an experiment comes out of an experiment, that nothing is lost or gained. Humphrey Davy in 1810, handsome fellow, he was able to isolate some different elements and also establish that these were elements, although he wasn't able to isolate those. John Dalton, John Dalton is important because he's responsible for the basis of atomic theory that we know it today. He came up with a model of an atom which is called the billiard ball model. And it's called the billiard ball model because it is a solid mass. He thought that an atom was a solid round ball with nothing inside it. The atomic theory that he came up had the following points. All matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms which are held together by forces of attraction. Atoms are indivisible and cannot be created or destroyed. Atoms of the same element are identical and have the same mass. 
atoms of different elements have different masses. Chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated, joined or rearranged. However, atoms of one element are not changed into atoms of another element. So that was against what the alchemists thought could happen. Atoms of different elements can combine with each other in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. So with all of these, um, Dalton was pretty spot on. The only thing that he had wrong was his billiard, bottle, um, billiard ball model. The rest of his atomic theory is pretty much what we still believe today. He also came up with some symbols for different elements. And he was one of the first ones to come up with symbols for these. Basilius was so famous he made it onto a stamp. He identified many elements and hundreds of different compounds. And he also devised the system of using letters as symbols to represent the elements. And this is how he started here. He also calculated accurate relative atomic masses. And these were based on um, the mass of oxygen. Enter Mendeleev, who constructed a periodic table. And we can almost say he constructed the periodic table, which is how we know it today. But the most amazing thing was that Mendeleev was able to predict the properties of elements that had yet been discovered. And this is a table of the periodic table, which is pretty similar to what we can see it today. And this is in St. Petersburg in Russia. Okay, let's have a look at inside atoms and how scientists figured out what was inside an atom. Because remember at the moment we're looking at Dalton's billiard ball model. So J.J. Thompson... He discovered the electron and also determined the mass to charge ratio of particles. His model was called the plum pudding model because basically the way his model worked was that there were negative electrons in a positive sphere. Okay, the way he did his experiments with it like this, he used a cathode ray tube. Now, a cathode ray tube has an electric current passed through a gas inside a tube, sealed tube. And the tube glows with a coloured light. So this is your cathode ray here. You have electricity running around the outside. And you have a stream of negative particles, which are electrons, running through it. But they didn't know that they were electrons back then. What he found is this ray that was created here. You can see this ray of electrons. It would bend away from any negative fields, which were either magnets or electric negative fields. Because it was bending away from negative fields, that showed that this had to be negatively charged. So whatever was running through here had to have a negative charge. That's just another picture here. You can see that the cathode ray is bending towards the positive in this case and away from the negative, showing that whatever is running through here must have a negative charge. Okay, so here's your cathode ray tube and there's a screen at the end and there's basically, you've just got to think of this as being particles running across the middle. Okay. So what happened when we applied an electric field to these particles is that this cathode ray moved towards the positive. And because it moved towards the positive, it was seen to have a negative charge. Applying a magnetic field did exactly the same thing. It would move away from the south pole. As you can see here, it's deflected. The south pole has a negative charge. But if we put the North Pole towards it, it's attracted and the North Pole has a positive charge. Again, proving that this stream has to be negatively charged. By the amount that they are deflected, you're able to work out the mass to charge ratio. Uh, and this is quite important later when we look at spectroscopy and things like that. But all you need to know now is that he was able to establish this using this formula. Um, it's able to tell us the size of these particles, and from that he was able to tell that the particles are very, very, very small.
Thompson used different metals for the electrodes and different gases in the tubes and what he concluded was that the stream of particles must be negatively charged and present in all elements and it had to be present in all elements because he did it for lots of different metals and gases. Because atoms are neutral, they have no overall positive negative charge themselves, he said that there must also be some sort of positive charge present and thus you have this plum pudding model of these negative electrons embedded in a positive sphere of charge. Ernest Rutherford in 1909 discovered the nucleus and proposed the nuclear model of the atom and the nuclear model of course has a positive nucleus with negative electrons around the outside. The way he discovered this was what's called the gold foil experiment. What he did was he got a piece of gold foil and he bombarded this so he threw out alpha particles which are positively charged particles against this gold foil. And this is what happened when he did this. Almost all of the alpha particles, so the positive alpha particles, pass straight through the gold foil. And you can see most of them are going straight through the gold foil. Some of these particles, however, were deflected at large angles. And you can see that here. This one's been deflected. Okay, but not many of them been, have been deflected. You can also see here that some of them were reflected. But remember, most of them have passed right through. This showed that there must be some positive, very small mass in the middle. It has to be a very small mass in the middle because most of the positives went straight through. It has to be a positive mass and a small positive mass because the positives were reflected or deflected and those positives would only be deflected by another positive charge. So from this Rutherford concluded that the atom was mostly empty space again because most of the alpha particles went straight through and that the positive charge was concentrated in a tiny volume which he called the nucleus. Remember, most of them went through, only a few bounced back and that's why it had to be a very, very small center. And he called it the nucleus. And he figured out that electrons must revolve around that nucleus because we already know that electrons had been um, discovered by J.J. Thompson. He also figured out that the nucleus contains almost all of the mass. And this was his model here, the positive nucleus with electrons spinning around the outside. Okay, there was a limitation of Rutherford's model. In other words, it couldn't quite figure everything out. It didn't explain why light of specific energies is released when an element is heated. This is similar to when you do a flame test, you heat up an element and different coloured lights get let off. So now you've got a couple of chapter questions that you can move on with.